don't wake up and say, I'm going to be an activist, that is the career that I want. It doesn't work like that, really. Uh, you find yourself in these spaces because you're angered by something or you want to change something. Wanjiri Nderu is a well-known Kenyan activist who has participated extensively online and on the streets in a number of campaigns and protests. Her activism was heavily influenced by the era and the surroundings of her childhood and by her family. My grandparents were Mau Mau. I was privileged to grow up uh, having them around. So by the time they were coming to pass they, they had, you know, taught me and my siblings about the truth of our history. I also grew up in a time where there was this crumble for multi-party uh, democracy in Kenya. We had the one uh, party rule, Kanu rule, and uh, we had people who were fighting to have, you know, uh, multi-partism. up in that time so I know I saw my parents uh, you know converse about these things and even take part in some of the riots at the time we had the Saba Saba riots taking place so yeah so I did have uh, unknowingly I, uh, you know I was in this space where who I am today was informed by my childhood and my family With this background, Wanjeri saw herself evolve. She studied broadcast journalism at the Kenya Institute of Mass Communications and later switched career into the insurance industry. But a call for a greater good kept pulling her toward a larger cause. I was actually just going to take a one-year break. And I said, let me take a one-year break. And that time I was very disturbed about the issue of uh, the, the you know, sexual abuse of boys. We talk a lot about the sexual abuse of girls, but the boys never get the amplification of their issues that the girls get. And that is happening everywhere. It's not just in Kenya. And I thought, let me take a, a year and perhaps tackle this issue, amplify it. And then after that one year, I'll go back to work. Not able to go back to work because every single day I'm dealing with different issues. And then what tends to go around when you when you're when you tackle something and it gets a successful conclusion, what goes wrong that if you need something done, this is the person to go to. So that's my life every day. After her initial activism, Wanjeri went on to be part of some of the major protests and campaigns in the modern history of Kenya. She used her skills as a media and communication expert to capture and build the narrative necessary to obtain public support for causes. She's today a well-known social media personality with a vast network on and offline of active citizens. Together with a long list of causes under her belt, these are some that stand out. So I started the Stop the Thieves campaign way back in 2018. That has still been one of the best things I feel I've done. We went to the streets, we had a th over a thousand people coming to protest against the corruption that was happening then and well continues to happen. But I saw that and it started as a hashtag because my activism is mainly online. And uh, I've seen Kenyans own that hashtag and it's used liberally by whoever wants to use it. So that for me was good. The second one was switch off KPLC. Uh, so we came uh, together, six, six of us, and we taken Kenya power. The most corrupt, I'm telling you, I, I have no idea. I have no way of, of, sh of, of putting it in context using words how corrupt that institution is and uh, we took them to court over some of the issues that Kenyans are going through when it comes to our power supply theft within the the, the power supply uh, uh, system 
and uh, the third one is Linda Katiba. I was excited to be a part of uh, uh, a formation that stopped BBI, that stopped an attempt at assaulting our constitution for the benefit of a few people. Despite her successful activities, Wanjeri has had to face hostility that include a constant barrage of vile remarks and despicable labels as a woman activist. It gets personal and nasty, and support is vital for her to remain sane. Yes, I am uh, married and I have three children aged between almost 19 uh, so that's uh, uh, the first one is almost 19, the second one is 14 next month and um, uh, the last one is 10 next month and I'm expecting again. <laughs> And uh, what has happened in this space is that it started, the, the stereotyping of women in these spaces started a long time ago, especially during the Moi times. Former President Moi would quip, you know, those roadside declarations that he was always known for. I remember Wangari Mathai also got a lot of those attacks where she would uh, be labeled as a divorcee or your bitter or, you know, uh, these women who don't have children or women were always thought to be if you're in a space where you're raising your voice against injustice it's because you're compensating for lacking something that is either family or a husband but in reality that's not the case i know so many women who are doing great things in our spaces who are who have families and our families are actually with the reason why we do what we do. So it's a stereotype that is very common and I don't think it's only Kenya. I think in the African context, you'll find um, you know, people reasoning, oh, they're bitter. Those are just bitter divorced women who don't have men to love them. But we do have men who love us and who are happy to make homes with us and who are happy to make babies with us. So we are normal human beings who just choose to use, you know, to put ourselves out there you know, as champions of justice. The stereotyping and name calling turned into real actual threats for Wanjeri, like when she was physically assaulted and injured at Langata Mall in Nairobi in 2015. It is such real and clear present dangers that she has come to live with. Yes, I have been um, a victim of physical and online threats. Physical one, I, I, I was physically uh, beaten up of a campaign I was doing uh, about corruption in a certain um, institution where the person who I was talking about the corruption in an institution he headed before he became, uh, you know, this big shot politician is that, you know, I was trying to put it out there that he's the reason why that institution collapsed and he's the reason why the community that relied on that uh, uh, institution is as is now, you know, complete uh, uh, poverty and really a bad scenario. And uh, I was told to shut up, you know, so that the beating was because of that campaign and whatever I was talking about, is something that is accessible in the public domain. But because um, these powerful people tend to have their, their bad things hidden, even within our media industry, you'll not find a lot of these bad things being said about these people unless it's sponsored for political purpose. So that, that beating was quite frightening. It happened in 2015. Um, but also the online threats that we tend to get are uh, choreographed trolling where you have a, a lot of people uh, being brought together to attack you. And most of the attacks come as, you know, they attack your womanhood. So they'll attack your anatomy, they'll attack how you look, uh, they'll bring in your family, your husband, your kids. It's just a destruction, really, but they can be very defeating. If you're not careful, you know, they can put you in a space where even mentally, because every time you open your online spaces, that is where they are and that's where you see all the negativity. So it takes a lot of um, 
careful self, you know, care not to get affected by this. But uh, it's also gotten to a point where I've had to leave the country, you know, and leave even with my whole family because the threats have become so bad that it becomes necessary for me to take off and let things, you know, cool down and come back. Uh, I've gone even as long as six months at times uh, just because of the noise that I make. What makes Wanjeri a force to reckon with is her ability to be resilient and to find courage despite the danger and threats. She finds her solace in the people she fights for. In my case, every opposition I've gotten is from people I've targeted. So you'll find it's individual government uh, officers, the police, uh, you'll find um, people in very uh, powerful spaces who feel like we're interfering with what they're doing are the ones who sit down and conspire about bringing you down. So that has been my major uh, force of opposition because I feel I have a lot of public support in the things that I do. And uh, being that I do not have um, what... In, in, in Kenya, we, we, had, we are told that uh, the reason some of us do what we do is because of donor funding or we are getting money from, from the white people. That is why we are you know, complaining about governance or corruption or whatever. But in my case, I don't have an organization. I am not donor funded. I do have a lot of support from the civil society community, for instance, but not because I have an organization where I receive money to be able to do what I do. I do what I do voluntarily. So 70% of my time is volunteering in, in, in the activism space, and then 30% of the time is figuring out where I'm getting my unga from. You know, So that has been maybe um, the major uh, uh, hindrance to my work is that the people that we go after as activists in Kenya are the same ones who do everything they can to make sure they silence you. But other than that, the public support I get is what keeps me going. Because for instance, um, I look at a year like 2020 when we had this whole COVID issue and all that, and we had kids in the Kenyan um, uh, primary school system who are from very poor backgrounds who needed to go into high school and I went to a page that I co-administrate on Facebook uh, called Buyer Beware and I said, you know, we have kids out there. Is there anybody who is willing to give money to get these kids to high school? And we took over 45 kids to school. You know, that is public uh, support. So you don't need money to do what we do. You just need public goodwill. And that public goodwill is also the reason why we feel safe a bit in that when we have opposition from the people we are fighting, we have the public that comes and says, hey, that's our person, don't, don't touch them. Also the support from within the civil society also tends to keep us safe. However, Wanjeri is actually aware of the continued danger of activism, and she warns that despite the image that Kenya is a much more democratic country in the region, however, for activists, there are high risks that may not be visible at first sight. But the downside is that um, in the Kenyan context, we tend to imagine that Kenya is a very democratic space um, when it comes to you speaking your issues. And especially with our online, very vibrant uh, Twitter and Facebook and all those. And people tend to imagine if you compare us maybe to Uganda, where maybe if I was in Uganda, I'd probably be dead. <laughs> because, you know, uh, they'll pick you up and they'll disappear you or take you to jail or something like that. So it's very open in some of the countries how they treat opposition. But in Kenya, it is so subtle, what we call chiniyamaji, you know, so they come after you as an individual. So the kind of targeting they do only focuses on how they can inflict pain on you. So because it doesn't come out so publicly that you're being oppressed, people assume that Kenya is a very democratic space to speak or to openly say the things that we say. But when they decide to come after you, it's so personal and so individual, your next door neighbor doesn't know you're suffering. So they structure whatever. We have activists who've been disappeared. 
uh, we've had extrajudicial killings and we will not find that kind of up uproar that Kenya is killing activists. Why? The way it's done, it's so, how, uh, it's so, so subtle that it doesn't look like a problem, but it actually exists in this country. Even though Wanjeri does not have a civil society organization or officially affiliated to one, she considers the civil society vital to her activities and to activism in Kenya. The, the, the civil society community actually is extremely supportive of some of the things that we do as activists. In fact, when you are under threat, that's why it is important to have a civil society in this country that is robust, that is, that is so active that the common person feels in touch with it. So we, we, I have been feeling that as a, the Kenyan civil society, we are losing that connection with the people. But that also comes from the fact that we are uh, attacked a lot by the government. You know, they call us evil society and things like that. And they tell people, these ones are doing whatever they're doing because they're being paid to do it or they're getting all these dollars and things like that. But without the civil society space in Kenya, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing because I'm, I am able to call people who have a bigger voice than me and say I am going through A, B, C, D and I need you to stand with me and they will do that. So that's one way that helps to keep individual activists like us who are not associated with any organizations uh, safe. But also we have a big and huge challenge, I think, is the, the access to resources for, for, for many of these organizations, where you find uh, a lot of the people, the organizations that are doing really, really good work do not have resources. They don't have access to the resources that they need to be able for that work to happen. That is why we need now the bigger organizations that have access to carry these ones and, you know, bring all the efforts together because I may not have the money, but I have a skill set that can contribute towards changing or creating the change that we want. So it's not just always about resources in terms of money, but everything, if we all came together and brought together the different little parts of ourselves, maybe the civil society will go back to that, to being that space where Kenyans would feel, okay, fine, we don't have an opposition in this country, like we didn't have for, for a while, and hopefully it's going to change now that we have uh, the elections happened. Uh, but that lack of cohesion is, is there. We, we will not want to, to say it openly, but it exists. It exists and it's unfortunate, but it exists. So we do have a long way to go. We need to bring the people to our side so that they not only look at us as the people who can be able to 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 you know put government to account The recently ended 2022 elections in Kenya has seen members of the civil society divided over political choices. And Wanjeri stood by witnessing her fellow activists struggle with political allegiances and the aftermath of any open political siding. It has also led to a broader suspicion from the society towards civil society in general that may need to be addressed, according to Wanjeri. We still have a long way to go in that space, especially now with the mistrust of, of our civil society is in bed with status quo or not. You know, there's so much happening uh, that has gotten the public in a space where they're looking at the civil society space and going like, ah, uh, are these people with us really, you know? So, yeah. We still have a long way to go in that space, especially now with the mistrust of, of our civil society is in bed with status quo or not. You know, there's so much happening uh, that has gotten the public in a space where they're looking at the civil society space and going like, ah, are these people with us really, you know? So, yeah.
if I as one Jerry, my belief system says that I want to go with a certain candidate, I don't understand why that should affect my work as an activist if the people I am supporting are people that I believe will deliver. And if my belief system is such that I know I am going with these people because the platform they have is a platform I believe in. So it's, it's really a dicey conversation um, where we, we are expected as people within civil society not to have a position, a political position. We do have a political position. The danger for me comes in where we use our, 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 our spaces as uh, people within civil society using the organizational framework to support. I can support as, a, as an individual. I am allowed, it is within my right, to even go and cast that vote for the candidate that I want. The danger is, am I using my organization to front a certain narrative? You know, so now for me, that's where the problem comes in. If I am doing it, if, if for instance, you've mentioned uh, Martha Karua uh, running for, for vice president, that's, exact, that's within her rights to do that. And she ran as Martha Karoa. Does that mean that she, has, she, she doesn't believe now in whatever she believed in before she ran? You know? So we need to be very careful when we, when we label, because I look at it at times as labeling uh, of uh, individuals who've taken positions that now they have gone over to the dark side and uh, things are going to be very, very bad because we don't have people who are going to talk on some issues because, you know, positions taken by individuals, they have, they should do it within their right. Just don't use, I will not support any use of organizational either resources or power to push a narrative for a certain candidate. Now you, you've crossed now, for me that now crosses a line that is unacceptable to me. With the elections behind her and Kenyan society, Wanjeri is cautiously optimistic that eventually the civil society will find its way back to a more cohesive stand and put the polarized year of 2022 behind. We've had them uh, give us so many promises that very many of us are looking at and going like, okay, you promised A, we hope you're going to give us A. Because the former regime, we had a president who did not care, literally did not care. The president Uhuru Kenyatta would be given court orders and disobey them and come on TV and go like, Munataka Nifanyenini, over issues that are supposed to be handled by him. Now, when you hear the head of state asking the person who he's supposed to be working for, what do you guys want me to do? And we've given you the work to do. It becomes a bit odd for us as Kenyans. We wonder where, who else are we supposed to turn to because the buck should ideally stop with you. But he never obeyed court orders. He did what he wanted. It was chaos. I've never been in a space where I've seen Kenya become a lawless country like during the last regime so we are hoping for that to change what keeps one jerry going despite the risks and dangers that is a question that many of us would like answered by this courageous woman her answer is simple. I think it's a sort of madness. It's a sort of madness because at that point you don't think of yourself as a woman. And you don't go like, okay, as a woman, what will I do when I meet this man uh, holding a uh, rungu in the middle of town? Um, you know, I remember when we did the switch of KPLC uh, protest and a cop threw a tear gas canister, you know, the way they just shoot it at you. And instinctively, I went to the way the tear gas, the tear gas canister came and hit a journalist. And uh, when his leg was hit, he collapsed immediately. And my first instinct, because he was next to me, was to kick it back to sender, you know. <laughs> 
and they kicked the tear gas back to the police. At that time, you're not thinking, I'm a woman. I shouldn't be kicking a tear gas canister back. You're just thinking, get this thing away from this guy so we can rescue him. And he got really injured because it was a direct hit. So whether it's the adrenaline, whether it's a bit of being crazy, uh, whether it's the anger that's driving you, I really don't know. But the fact that you find yourself in that space gives you a sense of satisfaction. Like now I've not been to the street in a very long time. And I was laughing with my, my family the other day and telling them I've missed the smell of tear gas. Because every time we go to the street, they respond by arresting us and tear gassing us. And um, so it's, it's, it's more, I don't know, I don't know how to put it. It's, it's people, we, we, the people who tease us and say that we are addicted to that chaos. It's, it's really not an addiction to the chaos. It's when you've reached a point where your words are not being heard anymore. And whatever you're saying online or offline is not being heard. We are in TV stations every single day speaking about issues. When we are the only language at times that the government understands is public protest. But if we go to the street and the news people are covering, these people are in the street, we always get a reaction. Reflecting on her career in activism and her life path, Wanjeri has some sound advice for young girls who aspire to take a path like her in activism. When we use the word activism in Kenya, it's usually used in a very negative, um, you know, way. I am proud of being labeled an activist, but it's usually used in a very negative manner in this country. But there's so many young girls who think that it's cool, that some of the things we do are cool and they want to do some of it. You know, I've had mothers tell me, oh, you know, my, my child was telling me they want to be an activist because of you. And I, I go like, I, um, uh, you know, you become, uh, how do you tell this mother that you don't just wake up and decide I'm going to be an activist? Everybody can be an activist. It is, uh, I won't call it difficult, but it is a very, um, oh, I'm trying to use a word that's not going to sound scary because I don't want to discourage them either, <laughs> to discourage them either. But as women, we do have a voice. Uh, that is much more, and I think, much more far, powerful than men have. Uh, we live in an Afri the African context, uh, uh, like my background and the, the like tribe, for instance, that I come from, has had very powerful women. In fact, for the longest, we are a very matriarchal uh, system. So the women are the ones who have the voice within the Kikuyu community. So I don't know whether that worked in my advantage, but there are women out there who don't come from my community who also have a voice. There's something about a woman's voice that the community listens to compared to men. Maybe because we have so many men doing it. But there's a way you can be able to be powerful in your space as a woman for good, you know. And, and being a woman who is vocal about injustice is more a calling than anything else you know you can choose not to do what some of us do i mean i would have gone back to my office <laughs> but but here i am but the satisfaction i get from seeing cases i'm tackling getting concluded or getting justice for people it's worth it's worth each and every point of pain uh, that I have to go through, but it is not easy. So they shouldn't sit down and think, oh, that is cool. I've seen one Jerry on TV. So that looks something like something I want to do. It's not like that. And it takes a lot of pain and tears and blood and sleepless nights and fear. And, and just at times wanting to stop, wanting to give up. We go through a lot of emotions every day. Do I really want to do this? Do you? So it's not as an easy thing. But you can be an activist in any space. If you're that child in school who has a teacher who is not fair and you tell off that teacher, that is activism. So it's not something like a career that you can say, when I grow up, I want to be an activist. No, you just find yourself in that space. <laughs>